I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God in Alhamdulillah was salatu was salam wa ala rasulillah to proceed. My dearest brothers and sisters in humanity, I greet you with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Today, we're going to be talking about a man that came from the 7th century Arabia that I believe changed the world. And this man is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon whom be peace. Now, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, he had a claim, he made a claim 1400 years ago. And this claim, I believe, is an eternal claim. And it lasts the test of time. The reason I'm saying this is because we can articulate a very positive argument using our rational capacity, our reasoning, our intellect, our common sense. We could use this to assess whether his claim was true. And this claim was, I am the messenger of God. I am the messenger of Allah. And interestingly, we can assess this claim in the following way. Number one, he was actually lying. Number two, he was deluded. Number three, he was both lying and deluded. Number four, he was speaking the truth. And there is a fifth hidden one, which is that it's based on legend. That the whole history concerning his life and even his claim is legendary, meaning that we can't really believe in the Islamic historical narratives. So let's continue with using our mind, using our rational faculties and capacity and assess this logical structure, these logical possibilities. So let's take the first one. Could he be lying about his claim? He made a claim that he was the final messenger of God. Could he be lying? Well, let's look at his life. I would argue to claim the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace a liar would be equivalent to rejecting that our own mothers are our mothers. Why am I saying this? Is because, for example, what is the proof that we have that my mother is my mother? Or your mother is your mother? We don't have any proof. I mean, no one's going to claim they have a DNA certificate at home and that's the only reason they believe that that's why their mother is their mother. No, of course not. Why do we believe truthfully, with certainty, that our mothers are our mothers? The only reason we do that is because of what we call authentic and valid testimony. The testimony of your own mother, the testimony of your father, of the doctor, of the midwife. So you have four or five testimonies, if you like, that show with good reason that your mother is your mother. But interestingly, we have 10,000 authentic and valid testimonies concerning the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And these were the 10,000 companions of the Prophet Muhammad. So this is interesting. I mean, if these testimonies are true, then if we reject them, it's like rejecting our own mother because when you have about four or five testimonies for our own mother, but for the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, we have 10,000. And this is an interesting argument via that the epistemology of testimony, if you like, which is epistemology means the study of knowledge or the study of belief. And testimony, when it's authentic and valid, is actually a valid source of knowledge. But there is a greater argument against claiming that the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace is a liar, which is to claim he's a liar would be to claim that no one has ever spoken the truth because the psychological profile of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace is not in line with the profile of a liar. I studied psychology at university and when you look at the life of Muhammad as a man you would see that it's impossible to claim he was a liar. Why? Because he had a simple message. His simple message was La ilaha illallah which basically means there is no deity worthy of worship but the deity Allah al ilah the deity and he wanted to announce this to mankind regardless of context. I mean he was offered riches power, women, money, everything, and he rejected it just for the message. He was tortured, his companions were tortured and killed. He was so hungry when he was boycotted from his beloved city Mecca, that he was tying two stones to his stomach. He travelled to a town in Arabia called Ta'if, and he told them, just worship the one true God. And children of the town would stone him for hours. 
and the blood was running down his legs with the historians and the scholars say that his sandals were stuck to the sand. He made all of these sacrifices just for a simple message of La ilaha illallah. We also know he was very brave. In the battle of Hunayn, when he was defending Muslims and non-Muslims of the state. There were thousands of arrows in this battle. And his companions and the army had to inevitably retreat. But he was still marching forward and he said, I am the messenger of God. I am not a liar. Such bravery. How can this be the product of a liar? How can this life resemble the life of a liar? Because we know from a psychological perspective, a liar lies for some worldly gain. Honor, glory, riches, power. He rejected all of this. He was poor. There was no smoke coming out of the house of his wife for six months, meaning there was nothing to cook. So really, just think about it. Is this a man who we can claim is a liar? The onus of proof is on the one who's making the claim that he's a liar. We have no proof when we look at his life. This is why I say, to say that Muhammad upon whom be peace is a liar, is to claim that no one has ever spoken the truth. So we know he couldn't have lied. Let's go to the next option. Maybe he was deluded, maybe he was crazy or he was a madman. Now, we know this straight away can't be true just by looking at his teachings. Look at his teachings, his prophetic teachings known as a hadith, plural or hadith in singular in the Arabic tradition. Now, his teachings are quite phenomenal. Phenomenal. For example, he said that true richness is not having riches, but it's having a rich soul, having a content, rich soul. He said there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. He also said, "La yu'minu ahadakum hatta yuhibba li ma yuhibbu li nafsihi." This is the Arabic version, and in English it means you don't truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace said, if you don't show mercy, you will not be shown mercy. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace said, that when you put compassion and kindness in something, it elevates it. If you remove kindness and compassion, it degrades it. And we have various other prophetic traditions concerning geopolitics even. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace peace said, that the son of Adam, the human being, all he needs is food, shelter and clothing, which he defined the essential limited needs, which creates an economic philosophy of distribution, unlike the one that we have in capitalism, which is false actually, which says there are too many needs and not enough resources. It's a false geopolitical reality, where we know according to the Food Agricultural Organization, that there are enough calories on this planet to feed three planets. So are these teachings, the product of a deluded man? Of course not. But there is an even stronger argument because when we look at his life, there were, very, there were various instances and context that he could have used to support his delusion. For example, he could have said, yes, that happened because I am truly a prophet, I must be right. But he didn't do that. An example of this is there was an eclipse of the moon when his son Ibrahim passed away at early age. And all the Arabs said, he passed away because, rather the eclipse happened because your son passed away. But the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace said, no, an eclipse happens for no one's death. So we have no good reason to believe he's deluded by looking at his teachings and looking at his life. Could he be both? Well, we know he wasn't a liar and he wasn't deluded. So if you add both things that are not true, then it's still not true. So he couldn't be both. So the best explanation is that he was speaking the truth. It's a very simple, profound argument. But remember the fifth option, there was a hidden option, which is it's legendary. Because if you do like look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, actually you can only conclude he was speaking the truth. This is why Professor Montgomery Watt in his publication, Muhammad at Mecca, he said to claim Muhammad an imposter creates far more problems than it solves. So if you do look at his life, you know that he must have been speaking the truth. The only counter argument is that his life is based on legend, it's not true. But this is a false misrepresentation 
of the Islamic historical science. Because the way the Islamic scholars preserved history concerning the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace is actually a very robust method. It is called in the Arabic tradition Ilmul Hadith, the knowledge of Hadith. And it's an amazing science because what we have is not only a text, which is called the Matan, but an Isnad, which is a chain of narration. And everybody in the chain of narration must have met each other, okay? Like A must have met B and B must have met C and C must have met D. And each person in that chain must have a biography, which is called Ilmur Rijal, the science of people. And we have 10,000 biographies of narrators. And we must conclude they were truthful, that they never lied. They were not sinful. They were not, they were not unrighteous. So we know that they're all valid, authentic or validated people along this chain. And this is a very brief glimpse at the history of science from the Islamic perspective. So we have a mutton, a text, and we have a chain of narration. And this is quite profound because each person along the chain is authenticated. This doesn't even happen in Western history sometimes. I mean, to reject the Islamic model would be to reject Aristotle because we know Aristotle only came to us via Plato. Or it is to reject 1066, the Battle of Hastings in England, because those narratives came via testimony as well, whether it's written testimony or oral testimony. And our science is quite detailed because we have biographical data of everyone along the chain of narration. Now, obviously, you have various scholars like Shah and others who say that, you know, we can't trust these narratives because they're biased. But when someone claims bias, they they have to prove it. Because when you look at these prophetic traditions, you have some that claim the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace fell off his horse. There are some women who came to the Prophet Muhammad and showed them the sanitary towels. I know that's very crude. But the reason I'm mentioning these prophetic traditions is to show that these were contrary to the Arab culture. So for you to claim bias, you need to prove bias. Because the, these traditions go contrary to the Arab culture at that time. So the bias claim is not a valid claim. There's also another claim, according to Shacht, the Orientalist. And he says, well, we don't have any early Isnads or early prophetic traditions recorded textually. This is actually false. We have various compilations in the very early period of Islam. Now, obviously, this is a big topic, but I just want to show the robust nature of the way we record our history. And to reject our history is equivalent of rejecting the Battle of Hastings, the existence of Aristotle. So we've dealt with this contention, therefore we can still claim that the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace was actually speaking the truth. My dearest brothers and sisters in humanity, peace be with you. Today I'm going to be talking about a miracle of the Qur'an. It's a very special miracle and it is the linguistic and literary miracle of the Qur'anic discourse. Now, before I get into that, I really want to discuss what do we mean by a miracle? Because traditionally in Western philosophy, if we read the likes of David Hume, he actually talked about a miracle in the following way. And he said it is a breaking of a natural law. And he actually had a contention to this because he said, look, natural laws are what? They're just patterns that we perceive in the universe. There are inductive generalizations of patterns we perceive in the universe. We take a particular set of pattern or of the pattern, we assume it's always going to be the same. And therefore, if something breaks that pattern, does it really mean it's a miracle? No, it doesn't. It's very incoherent, isn't it? Because maybe it's an exception to the pattern or we haven't been looking hard enough. So the point is, it's an incoherent perspective of what miracles are. I think from the Islamic philosophical perspective, the following definition of a miracle is far more coherent. Now, in Islam, we describe a miracle as an act of impossibility. Now, what we mean by impossibility is not informal logic. What we mean is that we can't find a natural explanation when we exhaust all natural explanations for a particular event. Let me give you an example. The Quran talks about Moses, 
Musa alayhi salam upon whom be peace. And this is similar to the other traditions like Christianity that Moses spoke to the Pharaoh. And in the Quranic narrative, Moses threw down his staff. He was told to throw down a, a wooden staff. And it turned into a snake and it ate other snakes, the illusory products of the magicians at that time. Now interestingly, this is actually a miracle because it's an act of impossibility. It has nothing to do with breaking natural law per se. It's more of we can't actually explain it in a natural way because you take a wooden staff and no, ma no matter what you do to the wooden staff, which is an inanimate object, it will never become animated like a snake. It is impossible, no matter what we do with the natural environment or the natural thing, which we now call the staff, if we cut it, slice it, put lemon on it, whatever the case we may be, whatever we do, it will never turn into a snake, ever. If we exhaust all possibilities, it will never turn into a snake. So this is an act of impossibility. We can't find a natural explanation. So it's a sign to the divine, it's a sign to the supernatural. This is a far more coherent way of looking at miracles. So, the Qur'an is a linguistic miracle. Now why am I saying this? Because the Qur'an is an act of impossibility. Because when we go to the finite letters in the Arabic language, 28 letters in the Arabic language, the finite classical words, the finite grammatical rules, we exhaust all combinations, we cannot produce the unique literary form of the Qur'an. We can't. Now, this whole argument actually stems from the Qur'an itself. For example, in Surah Baqarah, chapter Baqarah, chapter the cow, which is the second chapter, in the 23rd verse, the Qur'an says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِرَيْبِ مِمَّ نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدُعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ which basically says, and if you're in doubt about this book, which we have sent down to our Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, then bring one chapter like it and call on your supporters and your witnesses and anybody else besides God if you are truthful in your claim. This is an intellectual challenge. And we know this challenge came in a certain environment. It came in an environment where in the 7th century Arabia, the Arabs were the best at expressing themselves in Arabic tongue. So it was a linguistic challenge at the time. This is why the various scholars, Eastern and Western scholars, appreciate that this is a linguistic and literary challenge to the best people who could express themselves in the Arabic tongue. And we know this historically, the famous Arab historian Ibn Rashid, he states that, that essentially at the time of Arabia in the 7th century, they would only celebrate on two things, the birth of a boy and when a poet rose amongst them, because there was a socialization that the expression of language, the classical Arabic was like, you know, you're like a president or you're like a, one of the top guys in society. So the Qur'an came to challenge the people who are best placed to try, to try and even bring that challenge because it was an environment where scholars call them Arabic linguists par excellence, the best. So the Qur'an came to challenge them and these people failed. We know this because even the best linguist of the time, his name was Walid ibn al mughira he said, by God, this cannot come from a human being. I know the sciences of the language. This can't come from a human being. Now, what is it that makes the Qur'an unique from this perspective? Now, there's no point going into too much detail because many of you probably don't even speak Arabic. But to talk about this, we could basically say in a very basic way that the Qur'an descopes the Arabic language because generally in the Arabic language there are certain literary forms. We have saj, saj which is rhyme prose. We have mursal, which is straightforward speech. We have poetry, which has 16 rhythmical patterns based upon the length of syllables, which are called the Al-Bihar. And we have a style called Maqama. Maqama is a combination of prose and poetry. But the Qur'an descopes any of these. It descopes them. Because the Qur'an is not poetry. You can't take any chapter and the totality of each chapter corresponding to any of the Al-Bihar, the rhythmical patterns of poetry. We know it's not maqama because in maqama there is a distinct difference between its use of prose and poetry. It doesn't intermingle, whereas the Qur'an has this unique intermingling. If we read the works of Professor A.J. Arbery, he said the Qur'an is a unique fusion of prose and poetry. Also, we know it's not 
straightforward speech because the Quran is full of embellishment, it's full of rhetoric and eloquence and rhythm. And also we know it's not sajah, it's not rhyme prose because rhyme prose is, is quite defined. If we read the works of Devin J. Stewart, the Arabist and the scholar, he writes in the Encyclopedia of the Quran and in other places that rhyme prose is defined by having an end rhyme, by having an accent-based rhythmical pattern. The pattern is based on the stress, just like nursery rhymes. Ba, ba, black sheep, have you any wool? That's an accent-based rhythmical pattern rather than it based on the syllable. And also the definition of rhyme prose has a concentrated use of rhetorical devices. Now, the Quran transcends this because it has far more rhetorical devices than any other known form of rhyme prose. And it descopes structurally various features of rhyme prose. So it's a unique, it's a unique piece of literature. It's a unique literary form. This is why we have the likes of Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The Quran, a biography on page number eight. He says, Quranic verses as tangible signs are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. We have Professor Martin Zamet from the Netherlands. He said, notwithstanding pre-Islamic poetry, the Quran is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. We have Professor Neil Robinson in his book, it's an amazing book, Discovering the Quran, a contemporary approach to a vote text. He has a whole chapter concerning the dynamic style of the Quran, which in the Arabic tradition is called iltifat which is this referencing shifting in the Quranic discourse that it, it far transcends any other known Arabic discourse. And we have Reverend R. Bosfa Smith in his book Muhammad and Muhammadanism. He said, the Quran is a miracle of purity of style and of wisdom and of truth. So the point here is that there is almost a valid authentic testimony coming from people who have the tools to assess the Quranic Arabic. So it must be a miracle because the best people who knew how to speak and articulate themselves in the best possible way in the Arabic language failed to challenge the Quran. So it's an act of impossibility. Because it's, it's not only a unique literary form, but no one has been able to challenge and replicate this unique literary form. So when we go to the nature of the, Arabic la of the Quran, which is the Arabic language, and we exhaust all possibilities we can never create, the unique literary form of the Qur'an, which makes it an act of impossibility. We can't find a naturalistic explanation. Therefore, it's assigned to the divine, by definition. So it's a linguistic and literary miracle. Now, one contention is this. What about Shakespeare? Shakespeare was amazing. He had a unique style. So it doesn't mean Shakespeare's divine or has revelation. I agree. But Shakespeare has nothing to do with the unique literary form. We're talking about the structural features of language, rhyme, rhythm, the structural features. We're not talking about aesthetic reception, the use of the language in this particular way. Because Shakespeare wasn't unique concerning form, because he was known to use the iambic pentameter, which was used by many other English scholars. He used trochaic verse and blank verse used by Christopher Marlowe and many, many other English literators. So it's a, it, it's, it's a false contention. The Quran has a unique literary form. So from this perspective, philosophically, we know it is a miracle. So, what does it mean? It actually means if it's a miracle, it's from the divine. If it's from the divine, then what the Quran says is going to be true, because what comes from truth is true. It's like an epistemic foundationalism, which basically means that you have truth claims about foundational truths. And whatever is built on these truths is going to be true. So when the Quran says pray five times a day, it's good for you and it's going to make you come closer to God, then that's true. If the Quran says that we must prohibit interest in our economic model because it's an impediment to the distribution of wealth, then we should do so because it's true. Don't get me wrong, we could assess these rationally as well. But this is the easiest way. It came from God, then it's going to be true. Thank you very much for listening.